First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Heldigund and uh, uh, everybody who uh, organized this uh, symposium. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, thank you all for coming today to, to listen to uh, our talks. Um, my uh, talk today uh, is related to uh, my ongoing um, uh, care for and uh, uh, kind of insistence on uh, an investigation of universality, which is not such a, I must say, popular uh, term uh, these days in uh, contemporary practice. Um, my um, research of universality came through, uh, I would say, you know, a series of personal and professional experiences uh, that uh, led me um, to kind of uh, really think about bad art um, and uh, contemporary art, um, not from a kind of um, given uh, pre-written perspective, but from a kind of uh, sorry, um, but from uh, engagement with um, um, art students and uh, local uh, practitioners, uh, and also from uh, in, in different parts of the world. My experience in in Egypt and uh, brief. Uh, uh, brief uh, 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 critical workshops in, uh, in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, um, in uh, Murcia where I worked uh, as, as a co-curator in Manifesta. All these places and many others have uh, the predominance of what I would call um, fine art, uh, which is rather different than contemporary art. Um, So um, my talk today will, will have a number of interconnected uh, kind of bleeding into one another themes and axes. Uh, I've tried to reform these slightly based on my kind of gut reactions uh, to yesterday's and today's talks and discussions. Uh, some of the questions I'll be attempting to engage with um, are fine art versus contemporary art, what is really behind the division, uh, multiculturalism as universality, and where do we go from here? <clears throat> After and sometimes during the span of a transnational, uh, between quotes, art event, such as a biennial, journalistic and critical material circulate, circulates uh, pointing towards the events over underrepresentation of artists <clears throat> from a certain region, the nationalities of the participating artists, etc. In these debates, the wider issues of what kind of art is subject to exclusion in present day so called transnationalism or transculturalism, both in between quotes. And the reasons behind this supposed ineligibility are often overlooked. The majority of art being produced around the world is non-compatible with the paradigm of contemporary discursive art production. And uh, here I'd just like to make, you know, um, clear up a point where, you know, there's a differentiation between um, this contemporary discursive art and there are other forms of, you know, market, uh, more directly market-oriented art, with, like, uh, for example, um, uh, art that is found in uh, art fairs that don't pretend to be biennials. Um, so. Um, 
The majority of art being produced today around the world is non compatible with the paradigm of contemporary discursive art production that the curators of such ev events aspire to. In fact, it might, be, uh, it might not be a matter of aspiration, but actually of obligation. Uh, most people's imaginary of what art is can be tagged under the term fine art. Art characterized by the academic application or manipulation of canonical art histories. The present day biennial and similar event structures favor contemporary art over fine art. The, reason, the reasons given are unconvincing for most people. It is in unraveling, analyzing and healing the schism between these two nodes of art that might lay a more pertinent chance for a radical transcultural model unlike the one in place today. <clears throat> the spectrum of issues related to these uh, ideas are for me related to one question. Has universality not left a hole that needs to be filled or do, it, uh, do its ties with colonialism and notions of so-called Western intellectual supremacy make it too touchy an issue to readdress? Can we stop deconstructing universality and start thinking about it on positive terms? Is not universality simply put a good word with perhaps bad connotations that cannot be redeemed by the intellectual left? Multiculturalism, universality's supposed hair, is a mere branch of a much larger schema that is not just about inclusion and representation, as some of us would like to believe, but more importantly about the displacement of severely tangled class, gender, historical and polit political threads into the ambiguous category of culture. And it is this apparatus or schema that I will, like, I will be referring to in my talk today. Briefly, how would I define fine art? In general, like I said, it's characterized by the very traditional academic application and manipulation of canonical art histories and art schools. While some fine art is interesting, the overwhelmingly large majority of it is usually defined as weird, commercial, kitsch, by its counterpart, contemporary art. Thus, it is a rare occurrence to see a work of fine art in a contemporary art exhibition. And if one makes it, it makes its way into such an exhibition, it is always justified under some curatorial state of exception. But the question here is why fine art is seen as an oddity by the so-called contemporary. I think a closer look at the premises on which different universalities are based is key to understanding this. While contemporary art has successfully adopted the paradoxical universalism of multiculturalism, fine art has not. Fine art is stuck somewhere in between the old universalism of Picasso's Guernica and the universality of multiculturalism, not able to fully empower itself with either. It has become somewhat of a partial object for contemporary art, dead yet very much alive. And this is a struggle, I think, people working in places such as uh, uh, Alexandria, where I, where I come from, uh, constantly have to kind of put up with. It's like, why do we want to change the predominant you know, idea of what, what art is? Why do we want contemporary art? Uh, and sometimes it's very difficult to, <laughs> to understand why. And, uh, um, I think this is where you know my these these ideas come from. Oh, let, let me get to the core of the discussion before I become too abstract. Oh, this is actually you know like a, a group of, um, of 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 artists uh, called the Stuckis from from London. They're kind of fine artists, and I'll talk about them later. So, <clears throat> um, as you can see from this rather coarse kind of diagram that I've made, um, I try and kind of simplify 
the the idea of universality in what I call old school European universalism and the idea of universality today. Uh, so I will claim that the majority of art until the 80s was actually uh, old school European universal, universalism. Uh, at, the, at its very core, you had the Enlightenment project, which was embedded inside the individual, and then the individual kind of shed his universalism or her universalism to the world. Uh, I'll go into details later, but for the moment, its main characteristics today is that it has become a non-functional universalism. Uh, it's also become a ghost universalism. What I mean by ghost universalism is that it actually exists everywhere. So I mean like uh, a close colleague of mine studied exactly almost the same kind of curriculum in Philadelphia. Uh, trained as a fine artist. Uh, myself also trained as a fine artist and an art historian in, in Alexandria. Uh, so we share a kind of universalism but from the kind of an, a negative side. Not completely negative, but in a kind of negative as a ghost. Um, the the thing is that it actually registers in the uh, the life world. You know the the the, the Habermasian uh, Husserlian idea of you know like a a world where um, that is kind of like pre uh, um, um, you know, just before it's, it, it gets into uh, being kind of uh, categorized and, and analyzed critically. Uh, this life world, or uh, Lebenswelt, uh, is, is uh, actually more akin to uh, the, 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 the old type of universality, and thus it's more akin to um, uh, a fine art. I mean, like, if you it's a known fact for all of us, I think, if you just talk to uh, perhaps, you know, a taxi driver or something, you, you, they will understand, you know, like what a Picasso is in its kind of general features, uh, but perhaps not something uh, like Peter Wiebel's work. Um, now, for the multiculturalist universalism, or paradoxical universalism, uh, the, the diagram what it uh, tries to kind of map out is this idea that it actually uh, it works in an opposite direction. You can see universality being, being kind of squashed in, in, the, in the top, but there's actually a kind of bureaucratical, ethical, ascetical system that is in control of uh, a plural uh, center, a plural nucleus. And this nucleus is formed of things like culture, particularity, identity. Um, and I'll, as I say, I'll describe it later in, in more details, but uh, uh, for now, um, its general ca characteristics are, I would call this is a functional uh, universalism. Uh, it's also a paradoxical universalism, um, and it mostly fails to register in the life world. And uh, <clears throat> just to point out what perhaps what I mean by a bureaucratical, ethical, aesthetic system is. Um, Clarifying the ethical in particular, uh, I'd like to say that contrary, <clears throat> contrary to popular belief, uh, even believed within certain art circles, the, the current schema controlling the arts is excessively ethical, rather than lacking in ethical standards. It is precisely through invisible, invisible governance with o overloaded ethics that often have the same DNA as that of old school European universalism, that the system is able to maintain its appearance of democracy and openness. Now, 
when I define the point here um, of uh, the majority of, of art until the 80s actually being uh, um, kind of uh, more more functioning within the paradigm of uh, the old school European universalism, uh, which has the individual at its core, I can make a, a, a comparison that perhaps might be helpful here. Uh, two artists, uh, Paul Klee and uh, Alighiero Boetti. Uh, Paul Clay goes to Tunisia in the early uh, 20th century um, gets influenced by you know the colors the the, the culture the the landscape and uh, paints you know these you know quite beautiful uh, watercolors and, and uh, paintings um, Consider the difference between how Paul Klee responded artistically to a stay in Tunisia and between how Boetti created his map series by working with artisans from Afghanistan. Klee represents the artist who starts by spreading his individuality as the universal. <clears throat> While this 19... While well, this 1978 piece by Boetti signals an unconscious understanding of how art was going to be shaped along geopolitical and cultural lines for decades to come. It's also the beginning of the universality of multiculturalism. This, I think, is one of the main engines behind the collective unconscious of, contemporary, of the contemporary art industry. Now, Perhaps I can talk about how, uh, what I call old school universality, how it worked. The artistic canon of modernism managed to use its individuality as the medium of the universal while considering the particulars of time, place, ethnicity, gender, and so on to be of a secondary nature. These particularities and what they were a part of were in a way almost invisible to the canon. So for example, Picasso could reference African sculpture as form, spiritual significance, and so on, but whatever he did with it, it, wasn't, it was not really referencing or commenting on Africa or the idea of Africanness, Africanness simply because Africa was somehow invisible to his individual, individual self, the creator of universality. This strangely explains why the way of the ways of the canon could actually become popular all over, the, all over the world without there being clear forms of resistance towards their aesthetics or or their ethics simply because at the core of the work there was prominently the individual and the ethics of individuality so when we talk about Colonialism here. I mean, um, it's often what I feel in, in um, similar conferences. You know, we have this whole discussion about uh, the colonizer and uh, you know the spreading there. You know, kind of like uh, uh, whatever you know, like virus of of, of, of different culture and, and so on. But actually, you know, um, personally, I don't I don't have a problem with how modernism affected you know how for example you know uh, french modernism or uh, italian uh, modernist painters came to egypt and taught in the art academies in the 20s um, because actually at the at the core of it was an individual uh, um, and the ethics of individuality like i, I like i state here and what could happen later on was that the artist from Africa or Asia could switch their equation around with Europe being invisible to him or her and his her individuality being the nucleus from which the universality emerges. 
as long as the source of, you know, of, you know, of the universality was an individual with all his specifics of individuality and was not a heavy-handed cultural entity or a particularity outside of the artistic self, it was not an issue to reappropriate, develop and build on the mannerisms, techniques and ideas of the canon. But look at universality today. It asserts that its core is outside the individual and invites what it perceives as identities, cultures and particularities to formulate a plural universality. The problem is that it has to first define them as identities, cultures and particularities in order to allow them to form its core. Thus the equation cannot be turned around any longer and full control is achieved. Back to fine art a little bit for more, a more kind of uh, detailed uh, investigation of, of, of the term. Regarding the overall uh, predisposition of fine art today and what keeps it alive, perhaps there is no single exact reason for its continuity and its characteristics, but we can try to pinpoint a set of conditions that give it its momentum and crystallize its formulas, an equation that generates its continuity. Uh, in the Egyptian context, for example, an example I'm sure that is repeated in many parts of the world, we need to look no further than the practices of the fine art academies or schools of fine art, where art history is the first layer <clears throat> or the informational grounding for the artificial resuscitation of the fine art mode of practice. Art history is delivered as a clear-cut story that links non-critical narratives of social political history to artistic practice, step by step, in a deterministic formula. The idea is that the artist's methodologies and subject matters were a logical result of their political and social environments, and that changes or shifts only occur as a direct result of changes or shifts in these environments. The implications of this mode of delivering art history are huge. It leads to a kind of fossilization of art through narrative. The idea of the end of art begins here. The end of art meaning contemporary art is not art, which is an essential characteristic of teaching art history in such schools. We are somehow led into, a, into an artificial time zone where we feel and act as if art's great, uh, art's great uh, achievements have been already inscribed as something permanent and that now we exist in an era that can be described as an infinite intermission. An infinite intermission that starts after the end of this historical narrative. Putting a freeze on any attempt to step outside this zone. This artificial zone is cut off from the present and the future as much as it possibly can. Thus the only valid artwork in this zone is one that has a direct and simple predecessor in art history from ancient Egyptian to pop art. The artist must use indicators, symbols, signs and devices that strongly connect him, her to the lineage of this art history, otherwise it will not be recognized as art. So, one of the crucial differences between fine art and what has been labeled as contemporary art is, uh, is how art history is perceived. <laughs> For fine art, art history is a catalog or some sort of script or perhaps a scriptic catalogue of artist characters, methods, styles, symbols, and social-political indicators. For contemporary art, history is seen as yet another archive of images, facts, subjectivities, social and political agendas, and notions. So, 
here, I, for me, this is uh, my characterization, and for me, this is a very important characterization in in in, uh, in how I communicate the difference. Um, so, for fine art, uh, the idea is that the art the artist uh, is in a kind of uh, what I call the theater of aesthetic modernity. Uh, or in other, in other, uh, using another terminology, a scriptic catalog. The artist has to start before, or she has to start, before they even begin to work, they have to perceive themselves within this um, theater of an aesthetic modernity um, as a character. So, for example, you have certain you know, artistic characters, you know, like, a, like in a play, uh, I'll elaborate on this in a bit. Uh, and the ultimate aim before you start working is actually, probably in an unconscious way, is actually for you to insert yourself as an artist in this catalog, to be a continuation of this catalog. Uh, or this encyclopedia of artistic identities and characters. Um, during postmodernism, uh, and at least until around the first half of the 80s, most art in Europe and the United States was being produced at continuum with this notion of a scriptic catalog of art history. Consciously or unconsciously, artists had to somehow insert themselves into the script called linear art history. So if we take, for example, Artists such as Boys, Jan Ada, Burden, Kiefer, the Transavagadia Italiana, and others, we can correlate their work to the idea of the scriptic catalog of art history, or what I refer to here also as the theater of aesthetic modernity, uh, through the artistic persona they embody in their work, the romantic, the utopian, the expressionist, the redimir, the mannerist, the scientist, um, so an image, so for example, if we take this image trail, death and the body defying its natural limits, taking an extreme threshold, uh, taking on extreme thresholds of pain is a popular reference in fine art practice. Brought in from the scriptic catalog of art history. Of course, this strain goes all the way back to portrayals of the crucifixion in ancient art, but in more recent times, one can trace its significance back to Van Gogh's self portrait with a cut off ear, through to some of the performance art of the 60s. In this image trail, we see how this persona. And this is, I mean, this is one of the personas I mean, that, that, that is very present in fine art. Uh, takes, varying form, uh, takes on varying forms from modernism to present day fine art. An example being the Stuckists, who believe that most contemporary art, although they call it conceptual art, is dead, while their art is alive. Most contemporary artists and curators would think that stuckism is something along the lines of naive art. The division is really more about how one perceives art history. Either as a catalogue of artistic characters and personas one has to insert oneself into or as an archive that can be used to produce knowledge, positions and criticisms. So, an extreme break with art history never occurred, but what changed later was precisely this idea of how an artist perceives art history, as well as social and political history. When more artists started perceiving it, not as a linear scripted catalog, but as a non-linear non extensive archive, where almost no materials in this archive had the quality of being semi-sacred, 
and where these materials or infos could be renego renegotiated, faked, deconstructed, the category of contemporary art really came into place. So, quickly going through the characteristics. Contemporary art views art history, its perception of art history is an open-ended archive. It claims it produces knowledge. It often confuses information for knowledge. Contemporary artists uh, sees no necessity in inserting him or herself into the catalogue of artistic personas and characters. Their main question, using uh, a quote from Badiou, is how not to be formalist romantic, which is how not to repeat the various forms and romanticisms of art history, uh, or how not to repeat the romanticisms of art history or the existentialisms of art history, um, you know, the body, anxiety, death, sex, so on, uh, through new forms. And uh, what is the, the, the universality that is, a, that is at work is the universality of the archive, not actually the universality of the artist. And I think I'll make this clearer a little um, later on. So, for example, unlike previous conceptual practice practices, in this series of works by Lawrence Weiner uh, in the 80s, one finds it very difficult to pinpoint the artist's character within the scriptic catalog of artist personas. There is a noticeable shift evident in, the, in these works. They tell us that art has made the final and complete transition from the perception of its history as a scripted catalogue to the perception of it being an archive of, of ideas, images, macro histories, uh, uh, and identities. So much so that the artist only needs to write uh, or describe the sculpture to make, to make it present somehow. Uh, so this is exemplary of the archive, but this shift signals a new equation of balance between subjectivity and, ob uh, and objectivity. <clears throat> in the work Rant by my good friend Hassan Khan, an artist based in Cairo, uh, We can relate to the emotions of the actress. We can relate to, to the textual material in the video, yet we cannot identify a clear model of the artist's character that we recognize from the catalogue of art history. The artist is not creating something within themselves uh, and w within himself and sending it out to the world as his universality but through visual and textual signals tapping into the shared pool of experience which is the archive. The whole idea of knowledge production, the pretext for most of the current discursive art industry, particular, particularly its institutions, uh, uh, curators and finance, uh, financing systems, be it subjective or, or objective or a marriage of both, starts from the moment the artist perceives art history as an archive, the moment of contemporary art. At the other end, a fine art graduate trained to perceive art production as a catalogued linear script may be interested in contemporary production, but to actually produce a work that can be seen as contemporary, they must make the shift from wanting to insert themselves in the catalogue to a recognition of the archive. This explains why we get works that are half and half. For example, a video portrait of an artist with Islamic calligraphy and colored geometric, geometric or ornamentation, making visual patterns over his or her face, while gunshots and cello music can both be heard in the soundtrack. Here, the artist still perceives of art history and general history as a catalog. He or she is looking to insert their work into the encyclopedia of artistic identities and characters, and the work actually starts from, the play, from this place 
of artistic identity, identities or characters, although it uses contemporary medium and looks contemporary. Your individuality as an artist in fine art is prized highly, but at the same time, its source can only be the catalog. So in the end, it's a question of what you can come up with by diluting and mixing prefab identities and, uh, and icons. If, on the other hand, you conceive of art and life as an archive, you are not necessarily bound to such a fatalistic route. Although the power of the market and its institu institutions constantly push artists to stabilize their identities and equations. So if the category of contemporary Art today is going through what can be called a routine phase because of the repetition of once radical gestures and equations that have lost, lost most of their agency uh, and power. The category of fine art is a form of hyper-routine, functioning, functioning in an agency-free zone, the infinite intermission, intermission that I uh, mentioned earlier. It is not meant to produce knowledge but to reincarnate previous knowledge, all through the necessity of it perceiving art as a catalog. <clears throat> In my view, this might be one of the main reasons why fine art still exists. But if the whole mechanism is revealed, and artists lose their ability to relate to the catalog and start thinking in terms of the archive, Usually, what happens is a, trans is a gradual transition into, cont into the contemporary. Universality in fine art is linked to the catalog, uh, particularly to those pages in the catalog that, uh, that appear under modernism, and the artist's persona, or the artistic self, as the center from which the universal emerges. Universality in contemporary art is directly or indirectly linked to the premise of knowledge production. The archive, the grand global culture of many cultures, the global economy, and in the end, one can replace universality in contemporary art with another more pragmatic term, multiculturalism. The difference between the universality of modernism and the universality of multiculturalism, the dominant universality today, then becomes the indicator for how compatible an artwork or an artist practice is with the contemporary market. So we have a hypothetical <coughs> fine art student here. Uh, who's just graduated from a, from a non-progressive <coughs> art academy, non-progressive I'm using you know terms that are out there, and not necessarily my my uh, my terminology, but uh, you know a non-progressive art academy, something that's not along the lines of Bard or Goldsmiths. Um, so, what choices, or perhaps I would not say choices, but you know what kind of unconscious decisions do they have to make? Uh, Basically, they have four options, I think. Uh, the first option is fine art, market status, sellable in some local circles, and sometimes through international auction houses, seen as inferior by the other three routes. The first route or route he, can, he or she can select is to be a fine artist. Since the roots universality is dysfunctional, what it can generate is dead art, art void of any functional universality. In Europe, this also exists, but strangely enough, it sometimes uh, is seen as an alternative or underground. It becomes a lifestyle choice. This has to do with its original links with the idea of the individual as the medium for the universal. For example, the originally UK-based but now expanded movement called Stuckism promotes what it calls figurative art in contrast to conceptual art. In the movement's manifesto we read, it is the Stuckist duty to explore 
his, her neurosis and innocence through the making of paintings and displaying them in public, thereby enriching society by giving shared form to individual experience and individual form to shared experience. This is formalist romantic art, portrayed as authentic as the authentic mode art should function in. Anyway, in many other contexts, such as those of Egypt, Ethiopia, Azerbaijan, for example, I stress here that I would say that this is true almost everywhere and not in so-called developing countries alone. Fine art is the dominant practice in terms of numbers and general perception of what art is. Uh, the aesthetics of these practices are asking the opposite question of Badiou's, of Badiou's contemporary art. They are asking, how do we become formalist romantic? The problem is that uh, the question has already been answered numerous times, so your answers can only be ghosts, shadows of art already produced in Europe in the, fa in the past uh, five centuries. Uh, so fine art is a ghost universalism. Uh, an international backyard of non-functional universalism that can link an art student from Alexandria to one in Philadelphia, for example. The second route, contemporary art, condition A. Market status. Art fairs primarily. Thematic exhibitions, primarily with themes related to regions and geographies. Contemporary art condition A is another option. It is to take the second route of becoming a contemporary artist who uncritically emphasizes the particularities of their perceived identity. The particularities of gender, religion, history, state politics, etc. Some artists, even well-known ones, start off working critically with these particularities but end up being consumed by the particularities that they are trying to address. Contemporary art condition B. Market status. The discursive critical wing of contemporary art and its institutions. Critical biennials, publications, projects and exhibitions of the like. A third option is to practice as a contemporary artist who understands the mechanisms of the dominant ideology and its emphasis on particular, particularisms. The plan becomes how to negotiate a methodology where you are dealing with particularistic material in a kind of semi-objective way, not assuming that it makes up your identity, but somehow you remain outside of it, the archive. This is a wide uh, condition which features a range of different voices and positions that range from artists such as Rabia Marui to, uh, for example, Anita Dube, who Monica, Monica talked about yesterday. Uh, route number three, fine contemporary art. Market status, usually commercially successful. Many have teaching positions. Um, art fairs sometimes make it into discursive art events, but rarely. This is the half and half category. Half catalog and half archive. It thinks of itself, uh, sorry, it thinks of history as an archive, but still needs to insert uh, the artistic identity, the artist needs, still needs to insert him, her, him or herself into the catalog. Some of the work uh, Monica showed yesterday complies with the, this definition. Uh, a fine contemporary artist can be in flux, sometimes being more contemporary, and in other, ca in, in other cases being more fine art. Um. Back to to the yeah the the domain of multiculturalism again. Um, one of uh, one of the projects I uh, I did um, uh, as part of my manifesto was a project called the the the, the Mocha sessions. 
um, and it was based on this idea of a dead museum. Uh, actually, in the 70s, there was this uh, uh, institution that opened up in uh, New York uh, um, called the Friends of Puerto Rico Incorporated, um, kind of like NGO uh, institution that uh, the main mission of was to um, work with so-called Hispanic artists or artists from Hispanic descent um, living uh, in, uh, in the States or uh, in Central and South America. Uh, accessibility for, for these artists in, in, uh, in this, in, uh, to show their work in the States. Um, the idea of the, of the project, this, this institution later became, um, later changed its name uh, and became the Cayman Gallery. Uh, and in 1985, it made the final name change and shift and became the Museum of Contemporary Hispanic Art, or MOCA. But this final shift uh, only lasted for five years because eventually it closed down in 1990. Uh, one of the first things that interested me about uh, when I discovered uh, um, you know, the, the whole history of this uh, archive uh, was the actually the, the scale of the, the, the institution wasn't a big institution it wasn't like a, uh, it wasn't like the MoMA or a big museum but how in uh, the, the 70s uh, and the 80s while multiculturalism was really kind of still young and, and bare, um, you know, you could see the wiring. Now it's kind of really complex and, 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 and very, you know, fruity looking. You can't, you can't really uh, get at the, the raw details of it, yeah? But um, uh, the, the really kind of bare um, wiring of, of multiculturalism was exposed even through looking at the archives of, this, of small institutions. So it's not necessarily... Uh, the big institutions that carry uh, the uh, implementations of a certain ideology, but also through uh, this bureaucratical uh, ethical system uh, that has become embedded in our general uh, awareness and can become embedded in the, un the unconscious of contemporary art. We, um, we get to see the workings of, 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 of this ideology. Uh, and there's something as simple as the logo of, of this institution, um, where you have, um, you know, like, um, yes, the, the logo, the logo, yes, the, the logo of the, the Friends of Puerto Rico, and which I later uh, uh, changed um, to, to the logo of the project. Uh, where it represents, you know, um, a lamb sitting on top of a book, you know, knowledge production. For me, this is knowledge, knowledge production. And the three pillars of knowledge production are education, culture, understanding. See, this is it, you know, this is, the, this is multiculturalism. Look at uh, any uh, kind of uh, uh, um, uh, funding body. You know, what do they want from you as a small, medium-sized, or grand-scale institution. They're looking for three things. They're looking for these pillars. And this is what knowledge production is. So for me, uh, uh, this was a kind of, you know, uh, a simple kind of, you know, enlightened moment, you know, a very simple enlightened moment. Um, so, the, you know, briefly describing the project, um, uh, we invited um, uh, artists, um, six artists, to delve into a certain niche of the 1980s art history. The niche were, was uh, where multiculturalist discourse in art uh, 
began to look as if it was never going to change, becoming an inseparable and integral part of the art industry. The project brought part of the archive of the short-lived Museum of Contemporary Hispanic Art, MOCA, in New York, which lasted from 1985 to 1990, to Spain for the first time, and invited the artists to engage with the material. MOCA emerged during the rise of institutional multiculturalism, showcasing the work of artists of Hispanic descent who were deemed otherwise underrepresented in the mainstream. The archive was a catalyst for speculating on the origins and, and future of many of the recognized parameters in contemporary art, from identity politics to institutional critique. Um, and the result was six consecu consecutive exhibitions by six different artists. We had the material, um, uh, for some of the material of the archive because we couldn't get all of it installed. Uh, and it contained such things as you know, like letters of praise from Ronald Reagan to this little institution, you know, the great multicultural work that it will do and so on and so on. So you could really see the, the kind of bare uh, wiring. And, and, in, and in the books, uh, for example, you know, like Hispanic perceptions, Latin American primitives, these were all produced by the Cayman Gallery. And so what I'm trying to get at is it's not, we're not really looking for that something uh, that's so different. We're actually looking at the development of uh, the language, but we're not actually looking at, at, at a deeper level development. Rooted visions, current arrivals, all sorts of things. Now if we take this uh, idea uh, of you know like multiculturalism and move it into a kind of more uh, I would say uh, uh, a ground or that has been debated more uh, more than this uh, probably unknown uh, institution if we take it into something like um, uh into an exhibition that's very symbolically on a political level powerful. Um, and we take a look at, for example, two versions of Documenta, 11 and 12, uh, which I won't really go into the details with because, you know, there's a lot of really interesting and fabulous writing about these projects. Uh, but just some quick notes. Despite their much celebrated and elaborated differences, Documenta 11, 2002, and Documenta 12, 2007, exhibited works by exactly the same percentage of Western, in between quotes, artists, according to a study that, that is by a professional uh, analyzer that can be found online. Thus, if a third universality is to emerge after the old universalism, and the more recent multiculturalism, it should develop beyond the realms of statistics, hospitality, inclusion, arguments about la différence and sameness, victimizations and humanization. However, the curatorial project or artwork attempting to reach this third universality must also maintain some degree of particularity. For after multiculturalism, there is no way of reverting back to the sometimes almost complete absence of reference to contingent particularities found in much modernist art, for example. And perhaps this is a good thing. This demanding balance is important for a project that wishes to revitalize the construction of meaning on the same intricate levels of complexity in world and human relations, shaped by history, class, race, gender, and politics. In light of this, curators and critics might benefit from undertaking serious attempts to explore and analyze such complex issues as the reasons behind the schism between the contemporary and fine arts, instead of merely using the latter in an Adonian sense of bad art to define the borders of the contemporary. Documenta 12, Okwi Enwezo's Documenta, 
seem to accept the terms of multiculturalism's universality in order to perhaps stretch the audience, audience's imagination of both its limitations and possibilities. Edition 11 was a pragmatic undertaking that attempted to gain grounds within the prefab universality that allowed its existence. It was perhaps fueled by hopes and possibilities that seemed to be vanishing into thin air eight years later, uh, the time I wrote this comment. Perhaps you can you can sense that I'm 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 you know kind of like a pessimist. I'm not really uh, very optimistic about the future. Documented twelve, on the other hand, seemed to want to resist the universality of multiculturalism. But resistance alone does not amount to a solution, of course. Especially when the methodology suggests an attempt at an attempted resurrection of the universality of the canon that had the individual individual at its core. So I think, for me, the position of Documenta 12 was actually a better position than Documenta 11. But the problem was that it didn't provide solutions, but it reverted to old, um, old systems again. So... Instead of multiculturalism, let's go back to the universalism of, 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 the, of, of modernity, for example. And here is where I, theoretically speaking, on a very abstract level, I think is the, the curatorial imagination has to go beyond that and onto this third universality, which is, of course, something very abstract at the moment and nothing I can really elaborate very much. But theoretically speaking, this is what I'm suggesting. Uh, so, Documenta 12, on the other hand, seemed to want to resist the universality of multiculturalism, but resistance alone does not amount to a solution, of course, especially when your methodology suggests an attempted resurrection of universality of uh, of the universality of the canon that has an individual at its core, the incompa uh, incompatibility of this old universality <clears throat> that could be read in between the curatorial lines with the multicultural universality found in the majority of today's art made it seem as if the curators themselves were the source of this universality. It also estranged the exhibited art from its curatorial framing. The result, as most of us are aware, was a mass critical deconstruction of edition 12. The third universality, the universality to come, must be a thoughtful synthesis that takes into consideration how its predecessors functioned, what context they functioned in and to what ends. Uh, one of the upcoming challenges for curating and criticism is to experiment with ideas and methodologies that pave the way for the introduction of new prototypes for universality, while still functioning under the reign of multiculturalism, which is a necessity, of course. Universality has somehow been off-centered from curatorial deba debates. It exists as that which is present and yet not visible, that which is visible yet not present. With the political conditions looking as grim as they look today, perhaps it's time for universality to take center stage. Thank you very much. <laughs>